Hey everyone, welcome to the Wild and Uncut podcast brought to you by Ruger. I'm your host, Christy Titus. Thank you for tuning in. The line is going hot, so let's go full send on this episode. Since 1949, Ruger has embodied the spirit of hunting in America. Ruger firearms are built to deliver the reliable and accurate performance that seasoned veterans demand and new hunters can trust. At Ruger, we believe that hunting is about more than just the thrill of the chase. It's about the freedom and opportunity that come with it. This is our heritage, and this is Ruger. Hey, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Wild and Uncut podcast. I am here with Chris Dorsey. And I, I mean, we're in your beautiful trophy room. Yeah, as a buddy of mine calls it, the PETA House of Horrors. <laughs> but uh, welcome. Well, <laughs> welcome to my lifestyle. Yeah. It's, we're in your natural habitat, actually. Exactly. This is, yeah. If you have to be out of the woods, this is a really great place to be. And um, <laughs> what a beautiful place. We're in South Carolina at Bray's, uh, what do you call it? Bray's Island? Bray's yeah, it's Island? Bray's Island Plantation. We're kind of halfway between Charleston and Savannah. And uh, a little town called Buford isn't too far away. And and it's an outdoor lifestyle community. There's like 325 owners. It's the original outdoor lifestyle community in America. Been around for about 40 years. And uh, so when you come through the gates here, you're kind of, I always say I'm in my tribe. You know, I'm with my tribe at this yeah. point. People are drawn here because they like to hunt. They like the fish. They like the the outdoor lifestyle. We've got golf and equestrian and all that kind of stuff. But the real draw really is uh, top of the food chainers that like to be out in the field. Yeah. yeah. I cannot express my gratitude for being here. Yogi and I are, I don't think I want to go home. Yeah, <laughs> and I mean, Wyoming is great, but it's yeah. like two, 24 inches of snow right now. Like, <laughs> yeah. I think I just want to stay living here at the hunting club. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, no, we've, we've sort of abandoned our kids <laughs> in Denver. <laughs> And uh, it's full of snow, and it's been a cold winter up there as well. So it's uh, it's nice to come down for a little while. And thanks for giving me the excuse to, to be down here at the same time. That's, yeah, well, that's kind of a big deal. For the record, your kids are not like you know five; yeah, <laughs> they're no, no, seventeen, yeah, and yeah. you know they're they're plenty. They they can handle themselves. Yeah, right? uh, yeah. abandoned in quotes. Yeah, they're, they're, they're doing <laughs> just fine. They're, they're like, stay down there, Dad. You, we're doing great. They actually don't want you to yeah, come home. Right, so <laughs> right, yeah. yeah, no, it's yeah. Uh, this is beautiful. So we have been quail hunting, which. I have never quail hunted in my life up until yesterday, and I, I'm very impressed with my performance of hitting at least, I think I've hit two flying birds. Today I speckled <laughs> one, and then, you know, that's it. Um, so <laughs> well, it's been rough. You know, it's, uh, you know, quail are interesting because, you know, it's the covey, right? That, mm-hmm. That's the magic. It's birds crossing, going every different direction, and that's a survival adaptation, obviously, and that's the draw for sportsmen mm-hmm. is just, you know, trying to get on one bird and, and then one crosses and you track that one and then you track that one and you never get a shot off and suddenly they've evaporated into the cover and you lose yeah. the whole opportunity. But that's, you know, that's the magic of a covey rise, mm-hmm. you know, so it, it's always fun to share that. It's not easy. Um, you know, of course, people remember Dick Cheney shooting the the attorney down of the, the plantation. So it can be a little bit dangerous. You got to be careful about kind of staying in your lanes, yeah. picking your birds, got to look out for the dogs. And uh, so there's a lot going on in in a second and a half to Mm -hmm. process. So, like I say, they're not easy to hit. Well, it's impressive to watch the handlers of the dogs uh, running the pointy dog and then the flushing dog, which is a cocker spaniel. But, I mean, today, like, you had the covey rise. And one shot, you get one quail, and then you followed it up immediately with a second bird. Well, and that is so like the whole team, the whole dynamic of watching, you know, the 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 dog handlers, the dogs doing their job, and then you as a hunter ultimately doing your job. It, it's something to see. It is so beautiful. Yeah, I mean, there there is a lot of pageantry to the kind of the whole thing, and so even if people come here, which they do often, are not, are not bird hunters. They like seeing the dogs. They Mm -hmm. like seeing the whole action. And to to your point, it's sort of a choreography of of dog handler, 
pointer, cocker, shooter, safety, you know, the the whole thing plays out in, in a couple of seconds. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's real, you know, once a dog goes on point, once that pointer is locked up, you got a 12 o'clock tail, you know there's birds right in front of them. Um, then all the sort of the synapses are firing at that point. I mean, your your instinct is is to be very alert, and you got to be you got to be on your game. Yeah. They will humble you in a hurry, yeah. so you just you got to get on one bird, got to get on that second bird. But if you do it long enough, obviously you you develop some proficiency. So the excuses kind of evaporate after a while. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I still have uh, plenty of water to evaporate at this point, so I'm really <laughs> well. <laughs> we'll just let you, it. You did just fine. We'll so. just leave it there. Yeah, you did just fine. Uh, but you, you know, just you, you have this beautiful room, but you have literally been all around the world hunting and fishing, but you have documented so much of your own journeys, but also mm. other sportsmen's journeys. You've produced more outdoor TV than anybody else. In history. Actually. Yeah, I mean, we, we've been doing this a long time. I mean, it's uh, I started at a young age and, and uh, trying to avoid honest work for all these years. Is, Amen to that. This has finally paid off. Shh, don't tell anyone. <laughs> uh, but really, I mean, it's, it's just uh, if you can blend, you know, avocation and vocation, uh, you never work a day in your life, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the whole idea is just to do what you love, do it well. And uh, for us, I mean, it was, gosh, it's 23 years ago we started the company. It was Orion Pictures, Orion uh, multimedia. multimedia at that point, then became Orion Entertainment, then became Dorsey Pictures over 23 years. And uh, so we've done, I think, close to 60 series in the outdoor space. We've done more than 60 series in the in the mainstream cable programming space. So it's a lot of television. I mean, we've just been, we've been producing a lot of TV, shooting around the world for a long time. Back in the day, it was TNN, the Nashville mm -hmm. Network, if you remember that that and then it was ESPN, ESPN two. We we've done big series on on Spike TV before it became uh, Paramount, which is what Yellowstone is on right now. Big Viacom network mm -hmm. and and so just tons of other mainstream shows in the mainstream space. We've done Building Alaska, Living Alaska, Tiny House, Big Living. We're the kings of tiny. If you didn't know, that. I love <laughs> the tiny house shows. Yeah, That's no, like it's when I'm at home. The only shows we watch. Our, our house renovation shows. Yeah. I love them. They're so addicting. I, I, I do too. I mean, it's it's actually a genre that I, I really enjoy. Mm -hmm. and, and it's that, that start to finish, the arc, the process, the, the reveal at the mm -hmm. end of, you know, we, we do a series called Main Cabin Masters, which has been on seven or eight years now on, it was on DIY, now it's on Magnolia, which is the Chip and Joanna Gaines joint venture with, uh, with Discovery. But uh, but they take these little cabins in the middle of nowhere on lakes, typically in Maine. And, I mean, they're really junky little, you know, nothing kind of cabins most people would probably torch. Yeah. And, and they, they, they rehab them. They bump them out. They, you know, give them, give them a new roof. They give them an outdoor space, whether it's a porch or a deck. And uh, suddenly, by the end of the show, you're like, I want one. You know, I, yeah, I want one it. of those, right? Yeah. How do I get one of those? And that's the magic of those kind of shows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the magic of, of the video production and the quality of production that you guys yeah. are putting out there. And, um, you know, obviously being in outdoor TV for over 20 years, people love what they're seeing. Yeah. Well, it, and it's been fun because it's it's really brought us in touch with a lot of great people in the outdoors. and. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm a biologist by training. That's my background. And I've got an English degree as well. So what do you do with that other than win bar bets, I guess? Mm. Is you somehow get into television. But, or work uh, for fishing game. I yeah, mean, that's right. kind of. You know, that, yeah. that just uh, well, it wasn't going to be, you know, my career, I guess, down the road. So I, I had to I had to pivot a little what bit. What brought you into production? So you were, I'm assuming you're a lifelong hunter. Yeah. I mean, I grew up as a, as a kid. I had an older brother. My father really was not a hunter and didn't get me into it. Uh, but it was an older brother. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who had a friend whose father got him into it and it sort of went down and I'm the youngest of nine kids so I've got I've got siblings 13 years older than I am so um, yeah so it was really just kind of a, a passion I always loved the outdoors and and most of my family hunted and, and a little bit of fishing but mostly hunting and uh, it was always it was always such a family mm -hmm. deal you know it was really how we spent time together and and uh, and we love the meat I mean you know we would hunt yeah. deer fill the freezer so there was that sense of accomplishment, just, you know, kind of doing that. And, and uh, yeah, so it's it's fun to pass that down to my sons, mm -hmm. who both love to hunt. They're really good shots. 
Uh, one is a phenomenal fly caster. He ties his own flies, has since he was like 10. And uh, so it's fun to see the fun to see the succession here. And, mm -hmm. and I really get as much enjoyment now out of, of, of going with them and watching them. And, and I, took, I took Nate, the fly fishing guru, down to Bolivia. And of course, you know, he's 6'2 now. <laughs> he, can, he can cast a country mile and he's just vacuuming the river ahead of me, right? <laughs> I mean, Golden Dorado after Golden Dorado and I'm sitting there going, save one for me, would you? You know, and, and uh, he's, so it was, it was a hoot. It's fun to watch. It's yeah. fun to watch and it's fun as a parent, I think, which I'm not, but I'm, I can imagine as a parent to see that in your children. Yeah, I mean, it, the the force is strong in, in mm -hmm. both of them. I mean, they're... Uh, there are a couple of little velociraptors, and they've been like that since they were little monkeys, you know. I mean, it was uh, it was fun. We would watch them on a, uh, we had a pond not too far away in Colorado from our house, which you look at it and you go, maybe there's a frog in there, but there's yeah. no fish in there. It was, you know, but but they were like, Dad, let's let's go fish that. And I'm, I'm just sitting there watching them. And, and Luke would, would just cast, his twin would cast all the way around that pond to catch a, like a seven inch bass. And it was just like, hallelujah. Yeah. You know? But it was just that sense of accomplishment and, and, and the love of, of doing it. And, mm -hmm. uh, and now, you know, their horizons have stretched pretty far. I mean, they've, they've been to Africa mul multiple times and like I say, South America, Alaska and, and, uh, into Canada and, and all sorts of places. So, but, but we've always been careful to graduate them into the sports. You know, there's, and, and I'm sure you have friends that have taken their kids to, to Africa and they shoot the big five by the time they're 15. And I, I'm just like, why would you do that? I mean, don't, don't do that to your kid. I mean, don't rob them of the growth as a hunter and the experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, I started with rabbits and squirrels and, and I had a beagle and then I got a Brittany and then I had a setter. And, and uh, I, I just think it's really important to kind of let the, the Polaroid come into focus organically and not mm -hmm. force anything and i i think that's uh that's my advice to other parents i just say let them let them maybe take the little stuff and and maybe they go the first time and just shoot some guinea fowl you mm -hmm. know if they're going to go to africa and just let them absorb the environment they're in and the people they're mm -hmm. with and and don't worry about pressuring into to, you got to get a cape buffalo you got to get a whatever you know that'll come in time mm -hmm. if they have a passion for it and i think it's also um a remarkable experience for everybody, you know, when you're in those various cultures to experience the other lifestyles and, and giving to communities and back mm. to people and, and really kind of demonstrating to the world and, and at home in your, with your family of how hunting is conservation and how, yeah. you know, not only are you there as a sportsman harvesting, you know, what we would consider these incredible iconic species, but the taking of those animals is really contributing to the sustainable living and lifestyle of communities. And, and I think it's really important for kids to know that, especially ones that are privileged enough to go to places yeah. like Africa or any other country and be able to provide that, to tell that story to their peers, because mm -hmm. I think it's a, a story that is, um, it's a dwindling story that's not told the way it should be as often as it should be. Um, and, and making sure that kids have that story to tell is really important. Well, and I think anytime you travel, it's, it's the best education you can ever get, mm -hmm. right? I mean, and, and uh, for our boys to go when they were 10 years old to Africa, um, for them, it was as much about seeing the people how they live, mm -hmm. you know, how fortunate they are back in America. Yeah. Um, you know, so so it just gave them perspective that they didn't have until they until they traveled there. And and yeah, in terms of, you know, the the efficacy and the the value of hunting and, and how we need to communicate that, how we can live it, share it. Um, you know, that's always a really big topic around our dinner table. I mean, mm -hmm. we're talking about you know, and I always say to them, look, your argument is only as good as your facts. So yeah. you can have an opinion about something, but if it's not backed up by some kind of, you know, empirical evidence, mm -hmm. then it's just an opinion. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you're really no different than people who are hooked on emotional debates. And uh, and that's where we, that's where we tend to fall down. I think is is sportsmen and women, um, is is we sort of get hooked on their the anti emotional debate, and we've just got to be. We got to be talking about species. Let's agree, for instance, that we both want the best for elephants. We mm -hmm. want to have 
sustainable elephant populations. If we can agree on that, now let's talk about the best way to get there. Your way is to ban all hunting. Well, the problem with that is, you know, then the poachers move in in mass, right. and we have those examples in Kenya and Botswana and other places where it's just obvious that that's not an opinion. Here's what happened versus, you know, if they're, if they're sustainably used and there's a small quota taken and there's an economic incentive to keep them on ground, then guess what? They flourish. And there's lots of examples of that as well. So, again, it's just kind of making sure that they're, they're tuned in to what the debate is and, and can be advocates for it. And, and they're both, you know, my, my twins, you know, of course, they're a, a little unusual in that they're living with a, a guy who's constantly talking about the space and try to communicate, creating new platforms for us to have a venue mm-hmm. to be able to communicate what we're all about. But, I, you know, I, I know you're very active in SCI and, and they adore you for obvious reasons. And I think SCI has done a really good job. I think... I think the genius of what SCI has landed on is this notion that the Africans need a seat at the table. You mm-hmm. know, if you're going to if you're going to impose wildlife management on them, they're going to they're going to dismiss you because yeah. they live with the animals. How dare you live in London or New York and Washington D.C. and tell me what I need to do in my backyard yeah. when an elephant's running through and destroying my crops. my crops and knocking down homes or a lion killed my son or, or whatever, which is all a reality in Africa. It's a complete reality. Yeah. I, I just think SCI has been really smart about saying, why don't we talk to the people that live mm-hmm. with the animals, at least give them a voice. And, uh, and again, they're the ones saying, you know, we are meat eaters. We like meat. Um, and, and frankly, if an animal is a threat, we're going to eliminate that threat, just like you would do, you know, if, if you had threats in in your hometown you're going to do whatever you can do to stop that threat and and so you can't expect them to live differently so we got to find a way that works for wildlife and people in africa and uh so we got to talk to them we got to listen to them because we have a commingled habitat at this point i mean there's our population in the world is growing um and we have to find a way to equitably live with wildlife in their wild spaces and um, do it in a way that is sustainable, but yeah. also encourages the f- these animals to thrive and, and not only just mm-hmm. survive, but be better than they were before. Yeah, that's right. And, and again, I think SCI, you know, really has landed on a big story, a big position that really does have resonance in, in Parliament, in London, and and Congress in, in D.C. and, and uh, media centers in New York and Los Angeles in that, you know, these are people that have a stake in, mm-hmm. in what's going on in their backyard. And, and you can dismiss them if you want, but you do it really at, at your peril and wildlife peril because it, they're, the animals are not going to survive if there is not an incentive for them to be around. I mean, wildlife that pays stays. And mm-hmm. that's that's an axiom we've known, obviously, in wildlife management and and uh, hunting circles for a long, long time, but it's it's not widely accepted and widely known outside of our community, which is part of what we're trying to do, right, is, is tell that story. Um, you know, we're involved in the IMAX world doing multiple films, and, and, and part of the reason for doing that is to celebrate landscapes and, and wild places, which then creates a conversation mm-hmm. to talk about all that, that hunters and, and others in the in the community have done really to sustain habitats that then sustain wildlife. And, and uh, without that, the habitat, of course, we're not going to have the wildlife. So. And we're fortunate that you're, I think, probably the only outdoor advocate that is, has been published in Forbes. I mean, and, and consistently so kind of spreading our message to a, a more broader audience. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's been a passion for a long time, and it's not easy to do, but, you know, I've, I've been, as a recovering magazine editor, I've, I've been doing this for a long time and writing for a long time, and, and so, you know, I, I always have one foot kind of in the mainstream media realm with mm-hmm. television and, and one foot kind of in my passion, which is the outdoors, and so any chance I have to tell a story about, you know, the, the value of hunting and the importance of it and and, and the cultural health that, that goes with that. Mm-hmm. I try to do that. And, I mean, we did, a, we did a series for Discovery called Kodiak, which was all about the bear hunters on Kodiak Island. And, and Discovery's in 170 countries of the world, right? It's mm-hmm. a big international audience, multiple languages. So 
really the story there on Kodiak Island, which has the highest bear densities in the world, the reason they have the highest bear densities is not in spite of hunting. It's because of hunting. And, uh, and that's, a, that's a shift of, of looking through a prism that most people don't understand, don't appreciate. Mm-hmm. But I think once you explain it to them and they, under, they understand that, then, then they get it. You know, they, they, they get the whole dynamic. And so we try to use even our mainstream shows um, as vehicles to soft serve some mm-hmm. of this other, you know, storyline. And, and uh, we, we do that where we can. And, and sometimes you feel like an army of one, but um, you, you, you do what you can do. Mm-hmm. You know? Well, that's yeah. what we're, you know, we're all here trying to, trying to ensure a bright future for what we love and, and tell the world that hunting is not about killing. It's mm-hmm. about conserving. It's about enhancing. It's about wildlife management. And, but it's also about using a little bit of common sense, which tends to fall by the wayside when, you know, you have, you know, media components that are limiting information. And, you know, we were talking the other day about like my husband's um, German and during the election cycle or even currently um, when he would try to put uh, like a different type of news network into his phone. So, for example, he can get CNN. But when he would try to put like Fox News in his phone as an app <laughs> with his German credit card, that was completely censored. And he couldn't do that. Now, once he put a U.S. credit card into his Apple program, then he could have other mainstream media sources like Fox News. And so the there is a global censorship that is ongoing, whether it's around wildlife management, mm-hmm politics um and it is it is a it is a very regulated effort to ensure that our voice is not heard yeah i mean look that's a that's a big story obviously and and it, it's it's absolutely true and uh there, there's really no denying that that's a that's a, a, a an effort that's that's orchestrated by kind of large large segments of our culture and our our political leaders our our our, uh, you know, even our allies across the world. I mean, there's this, you know, cabal of, of people that are, are really trying to drive a narrative that that is not my lifestyle, that's not your lifestyle, it's not something we want to see perpetuated, it's not a future we embrace. So, you know, it really is kind of eternal vigilance. I mean, that's a price of freedom is eternal vigilance. And, and I feel like we're, we're all engaged. We all have to be engaged. And if we don't, you know, we're going to we're going to suffer the consequences if we just sit back and let it happen. But I think the good news is there's there are enough people in in bigger media. Um, I've, you know, I've, I've taken probably the biggest guy in media in the world. Uh, I won't I won't tell the world who he is, but but a guy who runs the biggest media company, certainly one of the biggest media companies in the world. And I'm kind of a hunting mentor of mm-hmm. his now, and he's he's getting it. He understands it, and I I, I love taking sort of gatekeepers, whether mm-hmm. it's political gatekeepers, senators, governors, et cetera. And we've done a lot of that. We spent a lot of time just sort of embracing those kind of people, helping them kind of go further down the path of a sportsman, so they do understand these mm-hmm. things. Uh, Governor Nome up in South Dakota is fantastic. Obviously, mm-hmm. she's. You know, she's she's very bright and she's very passionate about the outdoors. She understands South Dakota is a is a, uh, a state that's keenly supported by sportsmen. And uh, so there's a bunch of governors like that. There's a mm-hmm. bunch of senators that get it. I hunted, hunted with Senator Thune and and Tom Brokaw, another mm-hmm. media gatekeeper. These guys are all hunters mm-hmm. and, and gals. And, and so I think the more we just kind of, you know, talk about it and talk about the, the virtues and the values of it, um, you know, people get that. Mm-hmm. I, and most people are not, you know, inherently anti-hunting. Mm-hmm. And uh, you've seen the numbers on that. I mean, yeah. most most people, you know, have no problem with hunting. So, so we just have to kind of keep telling that story and pushing back on those uh, mm-hmm. cultural warriors that want to end what it is we believe in. I, um, Janet Holcomb is the uh, first lady of Indiana, and she's extremely involved in the Wild Jeep Foundation has spoken at their event. I took her elk hunting a couple of years ago. And if we have an opportunity, I feel like to reach out to leadership and invite them in, 
Um, we're very fortunate. Mark and Jenny Gordon, um, the governor and first lady of Wyoming. Mm-hmm. I moved to Wyoming in part because of the Gordon family because mm-hmm. I was in Wyoming at a women's antelope camp and the governor and his wife were there every night mm-hmm. um, encouraging the women. And, and, and it, there's women from all walks of life with all kinds of stories. And like, what an incredible group of people. Like, I want to live in a state that loves the same things that I love and, and is willing to listen to um, to my side of the hunting story and and the side of the hunting story that belongs to the hunter and conservationist. We're coming from Oregon. You know, at the time, our governor, Kate Brown, there's no way she was ever <laughs> going to hear, um, you know, that that side. And so having, and, and you know, we we talked about California and where we think um, California might go with, with elections. And if you can involve media from places like California into our world, you have an opportunity for them to talk to leadership and yeah. potentially, um, you know, change maybe their ideals of it. You know, Gavin Newsom is, I think, a front runner for a Democratic presidential nominee. And if you have enough influential people in Hollywood talking to Gavin, not, I mean, the chances of this happening to me is like, hmm. But if, you, if we had... The, if we had even one iota of a shot, like you making that difference with one person could make a difference in the long run. And, and, and that's what we have to do. We have to be willing to step up and try to get other people that are not necessarily anti-hunting, but non-hunters involved in the conversation. Well, and I think it's really been great to see women get involved. And, and uh, I mean, look, women have been hunting from... From early man, uh, you know, it, it, there's documentation on cave walls and and uh, yeah. you know pictographs that that women were part of the hunt. They were all part of the the, the whole deal, and and so it's really not that new. Mm-hmm. And uh, yet, it's great to see more and more modern women getting into hunting. And mm-hmm. and I think the whole locavore movement, healthy food, and mm-hmm. and uh, the activity is healthy. The meat is healthy, and and it's sustainable, and, and uh, it's a give back to conservation with funding. So it all kind of works. But yeah. but I think the more women get involved, you know, the more families get involved. And it, it should be a family activity. My wife loves to shoot. And uh, and our, our vacations tend to revolve around, you know, fishing or hunting. And, mm-hmm. and uh, that's just what we do. We don't go to the opera very often. We, you know, we tend to go out outdoors. So hence why you live here. Yeah. This yeah. Is worse it's, paradise. Yeah. It's kind of an obvious thing, but yeah, but it really is great to see women get involved and it's like one of the fastest growing segments of mm. the, the hunting population. I think it's the only currently growing segment it of the hunting be. population. Yeah, it might be. And I, I think, you know, the phenomenon of single parent households mm-hmm. it, and if you have more women hunting, that means probably there's going to be more kids hunting in general and, and that's all good. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, you know, those are future conservationists. Those are people that will bring voice to conservation. And people often say, why, why do you need hunters? Why, what's, what's important about hunters? And, and uh, to me, the most important thing is the voice for conservation, mm-hmm. right? If, if we don't have people that really understand and appreciate the wildlife, which I know always sounds counterintuitive to a, a non or anti hunter, mm-hmm. that you can love wildlife and go hunting for them. But it's actually very intuitive. You know, of course, if you love doing something like pheasant hunting or deer hunting, you want to see it perpetuate. You want to make sure those species are around, their habitats are around. So it's very natural um, if you just think about it for two minutes. And, and uh, But I think getting families uh, outdoors is really a great thing. And, and that, that's important in terms of getting women involved, too. Well, a lot of, the, I think, the conservation versus preservation debate yeah. is is not never ending, um, you know, preserving something you feel like, well, if I preserve this, it's going to be perfect. And, and we see this like coming from Oregon, there's a lot of wilderness that's preserved and there's zero habitat for wildlife. Um, the, the forest will, we've seen how many forest fires. I mean, this preservation debate to me is it completely irrelevant in the scheme of what's best for landscapes and wildlife that call them home conservation on the other hand is an effective tool Mm -hmm. when done mindfully no matter where you pursue the wild never leave home without onyx hunt onyx gives hunters the confidence to apply and draw tags in areas they've never set foot in extending hunting seasons and opportunities 
always know where you stand with public and private land layers, unit boundaries, and more. Onyx can even be downloaded directly to your phone for use when you don't have service. Wherever you pursue the wild, hunt with Onyx. Yeah, and you, you brought up Gavin Newsom out in, in California. I did a Forbes column on, on uh, Newsom and, and what he's doing in terms of trying to limit what, what they can do, the gun companies can do to advertise their product, mm-hmm. right? So the legislation was so overreaching that it was taking funding away from groups like Ducks Unlimited, mm-hmm. RMEF, et cetera, that are having fundraisers out there that have, that have guns as part of their auction process or, or whatever, um, it, it was impacting Hunter Ed. Yeah, Hunter people Ed, were uh, terrified to teach Hunter Ed or have anything to right. do with youth education outreach as far as firearms or shooting sports or hunting yep. for fear of. But it, but it just tells you the strategy there was to move the needle a little bit further, a little bit further, a little bit further to the left, and and uh, so I mean that's you know you've got to be very cognizant of of their strategy, right? This is not this was not a mistake. No, um, they knew there would be pushback, but again they're they're always trying to to shift the cultural needle further to the left. So the new normal is better than. For in in their minds, better than it was five years ago, and, mm-hmm. and that incremental loss of of rights and and cultural acceptance of hunting mm-hmm. in particular it, is costing us. It's mm-hmm. costing us dearly. There is so much perception too around um, specific predator species, mm-hmm. and people just cannot handle the harvesting of bears. We're seeing it. You know, Wyoming is constantly saying, "Okay, well, what is what is the the number when we have recovery okay well so once we reach recovery then we can start management right and the ball and the needle just keeps moving in in this and it's just a slippery slope where where do we draw a line in the sand and say okay you know let's take these things and and have a recovery plan in place and then follow up with implementation of management and you know we where we live you know, some of these recovery efforts that lead into lack of conservation turn into um, disasters for human-animal conflicts. And we see it with so many big species. You know, we have polar bears, we have grizzly bears, we have lions, we have mm-hmm. we have leopards. We have all these animals that are iconic, you know, predator species. And for some reason, I don't know what it is, wolves, about these predators, but people just want to protect them to a point and preserve them to a point where they wipe out everything in their wake and then we have nothing. Well, it, it's almost like a, a part of an ideology, I think. And, and uh, we saw it in Colorado, right? I mean, Colorado, I think it was uh, 80% of, of Colorado residents on the Western Slope were opposed to introducing wolves into mm-hmm. Colorado. So what did they do? With the animal rights groups, you know, some were backed by George Soros. My mm-hmm. God, this guy's like a, he's like a bad penny. I mean, he just, you know, he keeps Shows showing up. Shows up everywhere. He's everywhere all the time. And he's always focused on a certain ideology and, and uh, left-wing sort of uh, sensibility. And, and so what did they do? They We have a referendum process in Colorado. Mm-hmm. So they went to Denver and they went to Boulder to get signatures, to put it on the ballot in Colorado to introduce wolves, right? Well, wolves were never going to be introduced anywhere close to Boulder or Denver. No. So those citizens had zero impact. Uh, the wolves would have zero impact on, on them. On those but, citizens. But where they were going to introduce the, the wolves in the western slope, um, the farmers, the ranchers, the small communities, every one of those counties was opposed to the introduction. The state agency studied this in Colorado and spent a lot of money studying the, the whole issue and came back to the governor and said, look, this is a bad idea. You know, we, we are not supporting this. This does not make sense. But now we have ballot box biology, right? Mm-hmm. We, we have wildlife management through ignorant populations who are manipulated with media campaigns. Mm-hmm. And, and so now we have wolves being introduced to the Western Slope. Um, you know, we already have wolves coming in from Wyoming mm-hmm. in Colorado. So here you have the richest elk herd in the world, right? I mean, the, by far the biggest elk herd in, in the world is, is in Colorado, particularly Northwest Colorado. That's a super, you know, super zone for elk and, and they're very prolific. Once you get wolves into that elk herd, it will not be. 
it, you know, it's it's uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. And, and of course, the ranchers are, are, you know, livid. The sportsmen are livid. And then on top of that, they wanted to get sportsmen's dollars to pay for the introduction of the wolves. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, talk, talk about adding, you know, insult to injury in the whole process. Well, we've already been through this in Idaho. The Lolo herd, for example, yeah. was a thriving herd of elk. And it is literally dismally populated now there's there's hardly any elk left and and it's terrible to see what has happened in the state of idaho with their elk populations in specific areas and in there's been a lot of research around the low low herd so you guys can go online and do some googling on that and Mm -hmm. see you know what those hard numbers are i don't want to misquote um i have things in my mind but i'm not sure (laughs) exactly you know where they are specifically but the the numbers and the decline was so significant that you know it's it's just heartbreaking to see that it because of lack of management the problem with some of these predators specifically wolves is management through hunting is not a successful tool it is they are very difficult to hunt and they're they're a very intelligent species and management through hunting hunting isn't necessarily the answer for wolves and management of wolves and so you know even even if they opened it up to wolf hunting it does not mean that it would it would be enough to offset the needed amount of management. We see this with coyotes all the time. It's the same same thing. You know, people are constantly battling coyote hunting tournaments. Well, there's a reason that Fish and Game and different agencies have aerial predator control in the winter for coyotes because they they reproduce quickly. They're difficult to hunt. There's not enough hunters for them, and they're extremely intelligent. and And they pose a significant problem to local wildlife populations, domestic populations of livestock and um the numbers just blow up so quickly and and they're almost uncontrollable yeah i mean it's it's uh it's really interesting to see that whole the 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 state agencies are being dismissed Mm -hmm. they're being compromised and let's let the scientists let's let the experts Mm -hmm. who are charged with managing wildlife populations Mm -hmm. in the states let's let them do their job as opposed to you know, throwing things on on ballot initiatives that make no sense. Mm-hmm. I I lived in California when Prop 117 passed, which was the banning of the mountain lion hunting. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, what happens after that? The state now kills more mountain lions. That's right. Than than the hunters ever did, and and so you don't have any revenue associated with it because the state you're you're it's costing money to manage the the mountain lions. But it's all it was all emotionally charged out of San Francisco mm-hmm. and Los Angeles. But again, the state agency was bypassed through this this ballot initiative process, which is really kind of a disaster for mm-hmm. wildlife management. Well, they have it in Oregon as well, where there's government trappers that get to go out and harvest things like mountain lions in by the hundreds, and they we're paying for that as tax teller, uh, taxpayers, and it, it removes mm-hmm. the opportunity for hunters to do it and appreciate the harvest, consume the harvest, because mountain lion is very consumable, the meat is delicious. All of this is bypassed in an effort to protect the, or to, I should say, to shield a certain demographic of people from understanding that it's even occurring. Mm -hmm. It's like they want to hide that this is necessary and and it is absolutely occurring. Oregon's deer populations, elk populations are completely suffering because of mountain lions, now wolves, um, even the bear management could be done a lot better. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and just to shield the public public from knowing what's going on yeah I because mean, it's happening regardless right it, as a as a biology student you know i had professors always say that uh, you know 90 percent of the job of a biologist is coping with people 10 mm. percent is managing wildlife and and really that that is the that is the reality i mean just trying to deal with political pressures and and uh, ignorance at the at the uh, you know general public mm-hmm. level when it comes to wildlife wildlife issues and management is really just daunting and and part of what we're doing in the IMAX space is to is to fill a gap of conservation education in mm-hmm. America. We've got four films in production, one's done. We did it with Michael Keaton and Audubon and Ducks Unlimited. And it's in, it's in theaters all over the world now. It's in all over the United States and, and uh, Canada, Dubai. Uh, so it's in Arabic, it's in Spanish, it's in English. It's in Mandarin, it's in Taiwan as well, airing and and showing in Taiwan. But the idea basically is many states in America mandate environmental education, Mm -hmm. K through 12 or 8 through 12, something like that, but there's no funding. 
You know, so it's this catch-22. There's no funding, and very often there's no curriculum. They don't have teachers that understand anything about it, so mm -hmm. they, they really have a hard time teaching anything about it. So what we're left with then is a, is a population that doesn't have a first clue about wildlife, wildlife management issues, environmental conservation issues. They don't know. So what, what happens then? We get really bad public policy. Mm -hmm. and, and so we're trying to, and we're involved with a, the largest teacher training company in, in America. They're in 10,000 school systems. Mm -hmm. So the content being filmed for IMAX, the content being, being filmed around that is being pushed into these 10,000 school systems. It's on. It's going to be in streaming platforms. It'll be in te linear television. So theater, linear television, streaming into educational systems, and we want to keep a constant flow of, of great information, enjoyable, entertaining content, not, you know, mm -hmm. you know, sort of draconian, you know, you must learn something. It's, it's all done in a very fun and, and enlightening and, and uh, just entertaining format. But we're trying to basically fill the gap that's been left mm -hmm. by state agencies that are underfunded, don't have curriculums, don't really have ways to, to get into the school system. So that's, you know, look, it's, it's one more effort in, in what everybody is doing to try and make a difference. And, and we're hoping we can deliver on scale. We think we can in a way that's never been done before. So that's, that's kind of a fun project right now. That is really exciting to hear yeah. about because I... There, I've never heard of anything quite like yeah. it. I know SCI had the ALLS school, which is American Wilderness Leadership School, where you know you could potentially send one of your local teachers there to their school in Jackson, mm -hmm. Wyoming, and learn conservation principles through hunting mm -hmm. that you can then go back to your classrooms and, right. and help teach kids. Yogi and I just fin finished uh, how to write instructor training, but it's like so basic you know yeah, it's it's yeah. basic how to basically n navigate with a firearm in the field safely conservation principles are, are limited in what they're taught but man if you could couple that with IHEA or mm -hmm. get in with some of these other groups as additional curriculum we might have a chance to reach a really great number of people as well you know just yeah. to, and just to maybe even bolster what they're already doing that's fantastic because Hunter Ed is a great program but it can always use bolstering or that next step and you see that so much you know people finish hunter ed or they have an interest in going hunting and they don't know where to start and you'll mm -hmm. see that with a lot of single parent households where the woman's like look i i want to take my kid hunting i have a son and i want to take him hunting. i have a daughter who mm -hmm. wants to go hunting mm -hmm. and they don't even know where to start so yeah. I, they have no idea where you know okay we start with hunter ed we have continuing programs through like hunters connect now here's this next step of learning about conservation through hunting and i mean this is what we need to broaden the reach of our messaging yeah i mean how do you how do you create great engaging messaging and then deliver it on scale mm -hmm. right how do we how do we pierce the veil of, of mainstream media, create pipelines into mainstream outlets. And, and look, I had a, a conversation at the SCI convention in Nashville with one of the my old friends, longtime industry leader, and uh, and we were debating, you know, what are the what are the impediments? What's the what are some of the key limiting factors for, for recruitment and retention of the outdoor space, particularly hunting? And uh, he was really focused on access. You know, it's it, it's really about land access. And I said, well, to a degree, I think it is about access, but but not solely access, mm -hmm. because you can look at places like Canada. Canada's got public land. There's crown land. There's federal land all over the place. Access is not, not an, an issue. issue. And and yet their hunter numbers have plummeted. Mm -hmm. So I said, you know, there is absolutely a cultural component to what's happening here. Yes. And, and I just, you know, I, I, I look at my own kids who go to a private school in Denver, and they have three friends in the entire school mm -hmm. who do any hunting. And, and so there's, they don't talk about their hunting in their classrooms. They've had teachers. And again, keep in mind, this is a private school in Denver. This isn't the public school system. Mm -hmm. They've had teachers, you know, say, I can't believe you do that, or that's awful, and, and, uh, and, and pressure them belittle and berate yeah and, it, and it's just like if, so from their perspective they they've they basically been put in the closet yeah they basically just don't want to engage it's like mm -hmm. look i already know what your opinion is i'm not going to bring it up in front of you anymore and this is a teacher right i mean the you know let's expand the mind let's be open to ideas let's debate and, and no it's just you know vomiting your opinion to my kids mm -hmm. 
um, which which didn't make me very mm-hmm. happy, obviously. But uh, but that's that's a kind of cultural thing that's happening that's suppressing interest in the in the activity and the lifestyle. And and I think we've got to find a way to push back on on the cultural aspects and uh, engage in in that cultural war you know, for the hearts and minds of kids and, and understand, you know, what, what hunting is and conservation, mm-hmm. et cetera. But, but it's, you know, there is certainly a cultural component. Um, you, you know, you, you saw after Cecil happened, right, the, the infamous lion in Africa, and uh, every single media outlet was just lambasting this, this poor hunter who, frankly, my understanding is he didn't do anything wrong at Absolutely all. Absolutely nothing wrong. And and uh, they went after this guy in a, with the kind of venom reserved for high criminals, you know, and, and so it was really appalling. And uh, and yet they had the, they felt, they being the media people, they being the entertainment industry, they felt like they were, they were on safe ground going after this hunter, like, who gives a damn about a hunter anyway, right? And and these guys are awful trophy hunters, are the worst of the worst, and and that's their viewpoint, right? And and so, the mere fact that nobody called them out on it and said, well, wait a minute, you don't even know mm-hmm. what the story of, of lions in Africa is, you know, here's the real story of, of lions in Africa, you know, if if they're not hunted legally, if there's no economic incentive to keep them around, they're snared, they're shot, and they're poisoned. Why is that? Because they kill cattle, people. And they destroy crops, other other animals, and and so, you know, we we have to engage. We we can't hunker down. And I think, you know, at least I've seen this in our industry, our outdoor sporting conservation world, is that we tend to hunker down instead mm-hmm. of face the headwinds and and go into it and use it as an opportunity to say, you know, you guys are wrong. Here's why you're wrong. Here's the story. Mm-hmm. Here's what's really going on with lions in Africa. So if you gave a damn about a lion, don't think about Cecil. Think about the rest of them and, and what's protecting them or what's not protecting them. Mm-hmm. And then let's figure out if you believe in, in lion conservation, what's your approach? Let's hear what your approach is. Well, here's my approach. Mm-hmm. And I can back up my approach. What's yours? And and they can't. No. They can't defend it. They can't. They can't give you a solution that improves the situation for lions in Africa. So we, in my opinion, I was sitting on a, on a board, an industry board, at the time Cecil happened. And and, uh, and, and far and away, most of the leadership was just kind of like, oh, my God, we're going to get slaughtered in the media. You know, don't respond. Just ignore it. And, well, you know, just ignoring it has given us all sorts of closures. Mm-hmm. I, th- I think the, the situation in Africa when it comes to African hunting is, is probably the worst it's been in my lifetime. Uh, there's closures all over the place. It's trying to import any of these animals is getting extraordinarily difficult mm-hmm. despite, you know, the, the biological justification for hunting in Africa, just getting it, getting the trophy in. Now we have states in, in the United States that are banning Specific you know, species. Specific species. That's going to broaden. Um, you know, I've been on the board of Congressional Sportsman's Foundation for several years. And and you look at the, the number of bills being introduced across state houses and, and even provincial governments, because they're, they're tracking some of that as well. And it's just withering. I mean, it's absolutely withering to see how many anti-hunting bills... And it's it's it's, it's terrible, it's, and it's happening all across Europe as well. Yeah, it's not just yeah. African species; yeah. it is it's happening in Europe. And we were talking with Val yesterday about you know yeah. this is this is something that is this is an agenda that is a global agenda. Yeah, yeah. it's not just a local agenda. And you know, I I you know uh, would on social media obviously because I hunt, I get a lot of people. I can post almost anything, but if I harvest something in Africa. Holy smokes. It's people are just, they come out with, you know, white-tailed deer, we're cool. <laughs> Pigs, we're yeah. cool. You, you hunt those, that's fine. But the minute you shoot a sable or something with a bow or they come out with claws and and in RMEF did a really great campaign a few years ago is hunting it is conservation campaign and they did these infographics and mm-hmm. they gave specific facts and figures how hunting is conservation. And I would refer back to those infographics as an influencer. And I would, you know, if somebody would attack me for one reason, I would go back and find that stat. And then I would go respond to the person and say, look, here's the fact, like you're saying, mm-hmm. here's the fact. This is, this is how hunting is conservation. This is how this is relevant in this debate. 
this is what we're doing to solve mm-hmm. the problem. This is the effectiveness it's had. What have you done? Mm-hmm. If you love hunting so much and you love, an- or not hunting, excuse me, if you love wildlife so much, what have you done? And they often have zero answer. I'm like, okay, 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 attack me. This is what we're funding, we're paying for PR dollars, tags, licenses. You know, that's just a broad brush. Mm-hmm. Free market principles through fundraising efforts like SCI, uh, whatever. What have you done? And they've done literally nothing except stroke a keyboard and complain. They've done zero funding. Hikers, they put on their hiking boots. They want to go out in the forest. They want to enjoy everything that we've done. And they've paid nothing for it. They've done nothing yeah. for it. And all they do is complain. Well, you're not part of the solution you're the problem um and it's really interesting even like in wyoming in two weeks um i was just speaking with maria the the uh, large carnivore program manager and wildlife biologist and she works with sei and we're actually going to be doing a bear spray distribution in wyoming now in specific very bear dense areas because the hiker conflicts and hunting conflicts are so prevalent People are literally being mauled to death while they're out enjoying the woods because nobody wants to enact a management plan. Now we're having to pack in on mules, uh, metal boxes so you can have food where you camp so that you <laughs> don't put yourself in a more precarious situation where the where the bears can then pick up the metal box and roll it around and move it around and try to get the food out. And hopefully they don't maul you while they're doing this. <laughs> it's insanity to me. I mean, people aren't part of the solution. They're part of the problem and they're not offering anything in, in the real terms of how are we going to, you know, sub, sub, reduce human wildlife conflicts, increase wildlife populations and have a sustainable ecosystem where everybody's thriving. And instead they just put on their boots and bitch. <laughs> well, and to your point, your your initial point that that uh, here's what hunters do for conservation, for for wildlife management, for leading legislative efforts to protect you know species and and habitats. What is it you're doing? And and there's a great website. Uh, you know your your listeners might be aware of this, maybe not, but they should check it out if they're not. It's called humanewatch.org. Okay. And I've uh, never heard of it, so. Yeah, humanewatch.org. It's a it's a it's a group out of I think Baltimore that has has created some fantastic ad campaigns that really expose the hypocrisy of the animal rights movement. They do nothing. I mean, for instance, they take the uh, Humane Society ads that, uh, you know, where it's save this poor dog that's on at 11 o'clock at night or midnight. Meanwhile, you know, 99% of them are euthanized. Well, and it, there, there's that whole component. But it, they, they take that ad that's so commonly seen and they, they take attorneys in, in suits and briefcases, put them in cages and say, please give to the Humane Society of the United States. Our attorneys haven't eaten in weeks. They need to be fed. They've got yeah. a lifestyle to support. And and so it's this really clever, very mm-hmm. slick ad campaign that just really cuts to the heart of the BS of, of mm-hmm. the animal rights movement. And uh, and they're preying on emotion. They don't do anything. And, and people confuse the Humane Society of the United States, which is nothing more than a big animal rights anti-hunting group they they confuse that for the shelters that are mm-hmm. nearby which have no Nothing. affiliation and uh, so they've been trading on this brand confusion for a long long time raising hundreds of millions of dollars mm-hmm. a year and uh, and they were you know recently convicted of federal racketeering charges most people don't know that um, you know their their CEO went out you know I don't know if he went on handcuffs but he was run out of out of office. So the corruption within the animal rights organizations really is exposed at this humanewatch.org, and I would I would really encourage people to check it out. I've never heard of it, and I'm actually yeah. going to do yeah. a little bit of research into that and and look yeah. into them as far as uh, you know because we have to make what this group what these groups are doing uh, more relatable Mm -hmm. so if they can make it kind of funny in in the way of like hey we're really feeding lawyers not puppies and kittens let's let's say it for what it is that then that makes it more relatable for i think the average person as well yeah i mean and again that's how you mainstream this messaging and and uh you know you're, you're you're shocked into what's going on here you know i've never seen a guy in a suit in a cage and so anyway, it's a very clever group. They're, I think they're really exposing the soft underbelly of, of the animal rights movement in a way that I just haven't seen being done mm-hmm. by anybody else. And, and I think it's really great. And I would love to 
amplify their messaging as much as I can and, and we can. So, uh, yeah, go check it out. You'll, you'll uh, get a chuckle out of it. Share it with all your friends. And uh, let's blow up their website. Have you seen the proposed um, the proposal of I'm trying to recall what it, the wording is exactly where they're saying okay well if you want to bring a wildlife suit you have to pay um, like a fifty thousand dollar lawsuit retainer or something Have you seen anything about mm. that? Somebody's yeah. proposing that you, you, you remember oh yeah anyway I'll, I'm going to digress on that for now but I, I did see something on that where they're saying okay well if you want to bring this lawsuit forward you're going to put this money up front. Um, and hoping to cut the amount of frivolous lawsuits down. Mm. But $50,000 for these organizations is nothing. Yeah, yeah. They, it's nothing. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a nice thought, but there is, they are so well-funded. And like you're saying, George Soros is behind a lot of this and the, the, money, um, the money train of corruption and fraud and how they're fundraising. Um, it's, it's so um, well-developed. It's it's almost an unstoppable uh, revenue stream. Yeah, well, and it's all based on emotion, right? I mean, yeah. they they're selling emotion, and and it isn't about really at the end of the day for these animal rights groups. It's not about saving animals. It's not about conserving wildlife populations. It's simply raising money off mm-hmm. the act of hunting, trapping, etc. Mm-hmm. You know, they 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 use those acts as as a way to simply tap the till, and uh, the more charismatic the megafauna the better when it comes to raising money and and they're very good at it i mm-hmm. mean they're they're expert at it as a matter of fact so we've just got to we've got to play in that arena we've got to yeah. be expert as well we've got a better narrative we've got a better factual storyline mm-hmm. now let's package it in a way that the mainstream embraces it and understands it that's the key so you're in production for those of everybody listening and watching out there we all have a social media we all get censored however we all have some opportunity to share a brand and a message. Do you have advice for, you know, individual content creators on on resources approach, branding, anything like that? You know, it, I, I think it's just talk your passion. Talk about what you know, what you understand, what you appreciate. And, and you don't have to be big and, and broad in that space. No. Just focus on what you really know and, and speak from the heart. I mean, if you're a bird hunter and you love your gun dog and, and, and uh, you know, Anna V does a great uh, uh, podcast and, and stuff on social media as well in that wing shooting space. Mm-hmm. And, and there's others out there, many others, the uh, hunting dog podcast. Um, but I, I think when you talk about how much you love your gun dog and how you take care of that animal, and it's it's really the reason you go bird hunting as mm-hmm. much as anything, and just to see the dogs work. Yeah, and, and and frankly, most of the people I know in that space, if if they were given the choice between between taking a dog or a gun, they would just take the the dog. dog. They they wouldn't worry about killing mm-hmm. a bird. At the end of the day, it's really I want to see my dog work. I want to see the fruits of the training and mm-hmm. and see the dog mature and become, you know, the the animal that its genes have have made it and. Uh, so, yeah, I think if you speak from the heart about how much you love something, I think that's really undeniable to mm-hmm. most audiences. I think even if they're not hunters, even if they'll never pick up a gun, when they see somebody just say, I love my dog and my mm-hmm. whole life revolves around this dog and this dog is with me from the time I wake up to the time I, I go to bed and there it is at the end of the bed. And, and uh, you know, most people would wish they could be treated as well as some of these dogs. And I know my husband wishes he was treated <laughs> as well as my dogs. He <laughs> well, he's got to earn it. He's, I mean, he's, you know. yeah, he's got to put in as much time as the dogs have. Right, That's right. right. He's, he's got to earn it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, <laughs> being in movie production and video production, I mean, you have to have a lot of people that approach you like, "How do I get a show? How do I get started?" I mean, this is probably one of the most frequent questions I get asked. Is and I'm, I mean, I'm a nobody, right? Like, I've got one little, you know, sh- series that I produce, but you know, how I mean you have an advice for people that want to become broader scale content creators. Well, I, but I think there's, there's very few barriers to entry anymore. I mean, yeah. if you want to create content, go do it, go do it. I mean, go do it. And nobody's going to say, no, you can't do it and, and create your own unique point of view. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's, why does somebody come to you instead of somebody else? You know, what, what is your unique value proposition to a viewer, to a listener? What is it, you know, what, what's the secret you have? What's, What's your secret sauce? And, and 
focus on that before you just start throwing stuff out there. What is my brand? And, and sooner or later, you kind of create a narrative and mm-hmm. people will find you that'll connect with you that way. And, and don't worry about having a TV show necessarily. We just we just signed a deal with a guy in, in the Weather Channel. We're bringing this guy to the Weather Channel for a new, brand new series. And uh, this guy's got 4 million followers on YouTube. and Tremendous mil- following. Yeah, millions more. And, and he's just a fun, he's, I don't, I don't know, 29, 30 years old, young guy. And, uh, and, 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 and so for him, television is like, yeah, that'll, that'll be fun. Let's do TV. But yeah, I mean, he's already got a big platform. Yeah, he's there. He doesn't need TV, but it, it's it, kind of a neat symbiotic relationship mm-hmm. because he can expand it all. It's a different demo. Mm-hmm. You know, that television audience is 55 plus, you know, his, his social media is, you know, 25, 35. Mm-hmm. So he's kind of covering a much broader demo which will make him more attractive to his sponsors and his supporters and all that kind of stuff. So it's you, you, if you have success in social media, very often you can, you can leapfrog into these other platforms because I could tell you as a TV producer, linear television, classic cable TV producer, we're always combing social media. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're looking at social media all the time. We're following people that run networks. We're following their social media to see what they're interested in because we think that's a great way to find out, you know, what should we be pitching to that person, right? Mm-hmm. And it's very revealing, you know, I mean, it's it's like a forensic social media study, if you will, and, and yet it's very effective. So, you know, get out there and, and you know, and, and think about what it is you can add to the universe, right? And and uh, what are you good at? What's unique to you? And, and celebrate that. And mm-hmm. people will find you. I mean, they'll find you. And then Lord knows where it goes, you yeah. know? That's the yeah. beauty of, you yeah. can, you know, that's, we're very fortunate to live in the time that we live in the place that we live mm-hmm. in the United States where, you know, we can be anything we want to be. We just yeah. have to do it. Yeah, no, it's extraordinary to see what, what's working in social media and how fast some of these people just blow up and in the oddest things, mm-hmm. right? I mean, sometimes you're just like, uh, not in a million years would I have thought anybody would have cared about X, Y, and Z, but. Yeah but they do. And and there's other people like you out there. Well, and it's interesting because you and I were speaking earlier this week where some of my most popular content was trapping pack rats at my house. Oh yeah. (laughs) I mean, I would watch a 24 hour (laughs) marathon of, of trapping pack rats because I can visualize it. As soon as you say that, I'm thinking, you know, you're waking up out of bed. One's just run across the bed. You're screaming. Uh, Lights are coming on. The dogs are scrambling. You're reaching for the, you know, the Ruger, yeah. <laughs> you know, whatever. Yeah. I mean, no, it's it's a little less uh, invasive than that. But I did have, I left. When yeah, but I you got to work with me on that, right? Well, this is television. This is we're television. Talking about, right? It's true. It's it, in the house. The rat is in the house. It could have happened that way. Let's let's be real. It could have. I happened had something that way. similar. I did have one get into my shipping container with my yeah. hunting gear. I went to Europe. And I was in a frenzied hurry and I left the doors open. And I had been the week before doing these trail camera photos of these pack rats. Like, here they are. And they won't go in the live trap because rats won't, won't go in a live trap. Uh, I'm like, there they are. There they are on the trail camera. They were there last night. I couldn't trap them. I get in this hurry. I go to Europe, leave the shipping container door open. My 40 foot shipping container, which has all my dehydrated food, camping oh, supplies, yeah. gear. For two weeks, they ate everything. They peed on everything yep. because rats don't have a bladder, so they just dribble now urine. Now that's trivia. I didn't know that. I've, they, now this is what I'm told. So wow. I'm, you'll have to Google it for sure. But I'm wow. told they don't have a bladder, so they just kind of dribble urine all the time. And they. I think my grandfather might have been a pack rat. Actually, I to say that. But. <laughs> it was so disgusting. It was life ruining. It took me a year to like clean up everything. So I came home and had to take everything out of a 40 foot container and literally wipe spray down the container walls. I mean, it was just, it was a life ruining experience. So (laughs) they, some of them built a nest in my side by side and I'm driving my side by side and I smell smoke and my side by side literally was catching on fire. So my dad had a boom truck and we lifted up the side by side after I got the fire out and 
unscrewed the floor plate and the rats come running out and then one went un- under the engine of his truck and his fan belt got it then i mean it was just perfect for tv right like, i mean that could be its, be, that could be its own been, mini this series. could be some the pack rats yeah. it was literally like the most popular thing we've ever done on social media second most popular thing is baby mules but you know that's what i know <laughs> <laughs> it's like everybody loves hunting but really let's talk about yeah. baby mules no i mean it's if if you could watch uh, alaska the last frontier and they can make an entire one-hour episode on moving the outhouse. The poopsicle. The poopsicle, right? <laughs> Who doesn't remember the poopsicle? You know, here's this six-foot-tall poopsicle in the dead of winter. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> I mean, they made a whole episode out of that. And, it, and you know what? It was fun. Yeah. It was a really fun show. So. Yeah. You never know. Yeah. I mean, so you if you're out there and your goal is to just be the next YouTube sensation or have a TV show, right. just find your poopsicle. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> or your pack rat. That could, that could be a title of a book. <laughs> find your own poopsicle. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, that's kind of it's, a metaphor on life, isn't it? It's just you know? horrible. Yeah. But it is it is so true because I think we're all, you know, so unique in our own strengths and and um, finding that story where people have connectivity. You're also doing the, this new show, which I am completely obsessed with. I have to watch. I cannot wait to see it. Where you have a gentleman that's diving for hidden treasures. Yeah, no, I, I can't even disclose too much about it because it's. Uh, but oh, yeah, was it new? Oh, I didn't know it was that new. Yeah, no, it's new. It's in this production a, right now, and, and they've, <laughs> they've just they've just found a very interesting treasure. Yeah, that'll be big news when it finally comes out and, I can't and the, wait the to program watch this itself. Show. Yeah, it'll be a lot of fun. And you it, have so much you're doing that's incredible. Well, and and you know we're active in all sorts of areas. You know, crime. You know, true crime. We cover a lot of stuff in in that space and. Sadly, there's no end to how much true crime there is to cover. There's a lot of it, but yeah. uh, but a lot of build shows. You know, we we do a lot of fun shows. You know, main cabin masters. We do building off the grid on Discovery, which is people, you know, building in the middle of nowhere and and uh, sort of off the grid and and kind of into the wild, if you will. And and we kind of we were pretty active in starting. I think that whole mm-hmm. television genre about 15, 16 years ago. I went on a bear hunt in Kodiak Island. And my bear guide up there had this little rickety cabin right on the shoreline. And he said, you know, you always talk like Tom Bodette. You know, he had that sort of, Chris, there's going to be a new cabin right there. <laughs> right there. And I said, well, there, Bob, there already is a cabin there. Nope, not for long. So he just takes this cable. And we got, you know, cameras up there covering the bear hunting, you know. And I said, just roll on this. And takes this giant cable, wraps it around the house, hooks it up to his fishing trawler down in the bay, you know, 200 yards away and jerks that cabin right down to the beach, torches the whole thing. It's a a giant bonfire, and uh, proceeds to start building this this cabin there. And anyway, so we... I filmed this, put a little little uh, deal together on it, shipped it off to HGTV, and got a call. You know, the day it arrived there, producer called me and said, "All right, give me the background on what's going on here." Yeah. I said, "People all over Alaska build like this. This is this is what they do. You know, they have ice roads that they go in on winter, float planes, boats. You know, they got bears they're contending with. There's forest fires up there. There's earthquakes." He said, "All right, I'll take eight eight episodes." <laughs> And that was, you know, 15 seasons later of, of Building Alaska, which then spawned Building Off the Grid and, mm-hmm. and uh, Building Wild and, and uh, many of these other shows that have, have now come into the space. Yeah, and I, that's the only TV we really watch. My mom is obsessed with 90 Day Fiance. And when Yogi and I started dating, she's like, you guys need to be on 90 Day Fiance. And I'm like, no, I am not. <laughs> I am not putting my life through that. I am not doing 90 Day Fiance, <laughs> Pillow Talk, all these other spinoffs of, of this reality TV. But literally, like if you are out there and you have a vision you know, just put it out there and, and start filming. And the iPhones do a great job of recording. Like, you don't have to have a yeah. TV production set. You yeah, know? I mean, look, we've we've pitched that Alaskan dating space a, a few different times. We've come close with a couple of networks. I think one concept was Mating Alaska. The odds are good, but the goods are odd. <laughs> the odds are and, good, uh, but the you goods know, the, are odd. The ratio is like 80-20 men to, yeah. to women up there, of course. So we were like, all right. We could take the house hunters format where it's a, a woman who's just tired of metrosexuals in the lower 48. She wants to find a real man. Man. A man's goes, man. Goes, goes to Alaska and these men up there are really married to Alaska. They're never never going to leave Alaska. But no. they like, like They like, like women. Yeah, yeah, they like, they like women. women. 
and uh, you know, and and so she spends a couple days with each one of them, and then finally picks the one. But then they go on their dream dates in the bush, right? It's you know, it's running crab pots, it's running a trap line, it's going fishing, it's going hunting, just to see if they're compatible and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, we're we're going to sell that show at some point. We just haven't done it yet. You just haven't found the right person who's you know, ready to either mate Alaska or yeah. the odds are good, but the goods are odd. <laughs> yeah, yeah, either one. You could do that in Nashville, too, because in Nashville, I've discovered after last weekend at SCI that the single population of women in Nashville is like three to one girl to guy because there's so many girls there, you know, trying to date a country music star <laughs> or icon. So there's a lot of girls there. So if you're a young man and you want some good odds, move to Nashville, <laughs> Tennessee. And yeah, there's a lot of ladies out there. They're just looking for husbands. There you go. That's the tip you of the could, day. You could do a whole nother spinoff of that, you know, music sure. city, uh, whatever. I don't even know what you'd call it. We'll have to brainstorm that one, but you could do that too. And you wouldn't have to go to Alaska. There you go. Yeah. Probably be a lot more fun to film. <laughs> 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 I don't know. Farmersonly.com. Yeah, we exa- yeah. Well, exactly. I actually had somebody message me on um, Facebook one time. They're like, are you on Farmers Only? Because I just got a request from you. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> no. So then I did this whole social media post like, hey, you guys, if I'm messaging you on Farmers Only and we have a date... Don't be surprised when I'm not the one who shows up. I'm sorry about this, but it's not me. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's it happened. That that whole catfishing. Did you ever have you ever done any catfishing shows? No, we haven't. But uh, but we've had our our development team talk about that, and I, I was explaining to them. I don't I don't noodle. You know, I don't jig, you know. No, so. no, no. I'm talking. No, I know. Oh. <laughs> like, I'm just telling, oh, I'm just telling yeah, you, yeah, yeah. I don't know anything about <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, you know, yeah. so. Yeah, yeah no, there's anyway. so, there is so much bizarre stuff in the world. Um, and actually, you know, Yogi and I are kind of trying to launch this new day-to-day lifestyle series and. Pack rats, pack rats are you. I think I'm boring, but apparently we're just weird enough that people (laughs) might watch us in that capacity my real estate agent said when we moved to Sheridan because currently we're living in downtown she goes you know you're redneck enough to be friends with us but you're probably too redneck to live in town (laughs) and I don't know why she said that I mean the tractor the side-by-side the snowmobile the deer quarters hanging from the archery racks at the back I don't know what she gave her you know the that idea but um apparently we're a little too <laughs> redneck for town so uh we're we're looking forward to working on our own little lifestyle program and it's i just fun. want to see the pack rat episode you know so. we, I, you know and i'm kind of disappointed because i was told in wyoming they don't have the pack rat problem that we oh. had in oregon oh so it, it now it's just yogi fascinated with shooting domestic bunnies in our yard and I have to hide because there's no domestic bunny season so I have to hide when I see a domestic bunny like in our proper yard because I don't want him to take the air rifle out and dispose of the domestic bunny because they're so fluffy I'm like no we have to protect them. so are they just running through the night they of the are, lepus here kind I of thing? think underneath our yard there's probably an intricate system of bunny tunnels <laughs> um, that is pretty <laughs> elaborate and so they come and go however wherever and my dog's so fat and lazy he doesn't chase him he looks at the bunnies and he's like so they're really kind You're of good. feral, huh? They're, 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 they're just they're, they're everywhere. Kind of feral. Yeah, yeah, there's there's cottontails and then domestics, and wow. they're just they live. You go on a walk in downtown Sheridan on at least our side of town, and it's like Bunnyville. Really, they're everywhere. Yeah, and wow. we also have a pretty flourishing town deer population, where in specific areas you can actually bow hunt in your yard in town. You can get a permit and hunt whitetail deer in the cemetery. Or the park. Can you imagine going to the cemetery and somebody like shoots a white-tailed deer when you're visiting your grandma's grave? How weird that'd be. Like, (laughs) very odd. But apparently you can do this there. I don't know. Welcome to Sheridan, Wyoming. There you go. Yeah. But uh, yeah, like I said, I guess we're odd. We're all not quite Alaska people, but. We're we're right on the line there, right? We're right on the line of well, weird. Well, sounds like fun. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We love our journey. We're really excited and um, love living in a wild space and and being part of the outdoor. Uh, yeah. World. Well, Wyoming's a great state. I mean, it's yeah. uh, Matt Mead is a guy I knew pretty well, previous governor, and and uh, the hunting culture up there is fantastic. Big. The, the Cody Museum is really epic. I mean, that's a fantastic facility up there. Yeah. The Firearms Museum, the 
you know the the native museum yeah i mean it's uh, it's quite a place yeah. yeah, and we're we're excited, and for we're excited for all the viewers to join us in our journey, and um, you know, with pursue the wild with Wild and Uncut, and then our new our new show we're calling is uh, our Wild Life with a W Y. I don't know. I like you it. had another I name. Like it. You had another name that was pretty good though too. That home you, on the range. Yeah, home on the range. Home on the range. I like so that too. Actually, I think Amy came up with yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was Amy. She yeah. did. She yeah. came up with that. All of it's good, but you know, yeah. you can tell you've been in TV production yeah. and kind of filtered through. What do we even call people that have weird personalities like ours? Um, and ours, I'm talking me and Yogi. No, <laughs> not, no, no. Not, I'm mean, not lumping you into you, it. You've got to be quirky to get through this quirky, life. Quirky, you know? that's what you know? it is. We have, yeah. we have non-mainstream lifestyles. So um, anyway, <laughs> if you guys are out there and you're wanting to do your own media, this is hopefully a nice glimpse into what you can do and, um, and some of the impact that you can make that's obviously a lot more... Um, important <laughs> on a broader scale yeah through conservation Amen. and hunting and and that's what we all want to do is we want to be entertaining we want to have an impact we want to en- encourage um a thriving community of wildlife and the opportunity for us to enjoy its habitats and be a part of that space in perpetuity like um and make sure that we don't lose every year i feel like we're just clawing yeah. clawing yeah. clawing so yeah and i um I'm so thankful to be here at Braze. We had a great day fishing yesterday. Tonight, we're going to go eat some redfish. We're going to go shoot guns in a minute. Tonight, we're going pig hunting. It's like, this is incredible. I'm, this is literally living the redneck dream. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm, like, I'm at this beautiful home, and um, it's it's incredible. We just, Yogi and I both... Uh, appreciate your warm welcome and we love to share it i mean yeah. it really is is just uh it, it's a it's a privilege to be able to share it with other people that appreciate it understand it and uh you know it, it just builds more friendships yeah and we're so thankful and honored to be part of um of what you're doing here and you know being able to share this with you and amy and uh, what an honor to be here and i want to thank you so much for your time and hopefully the people that are listening to this podcast um are inspired in some way or just if nothing else, entertained. <laughs> there you go. There you go. We'll shoot for that. Yeah, we'll shoot That's for that. Yeah. So where can people find some of your productions? Where's the, I mean, you guys are so broad reaching. Is there like a website where people can go in and see? Because it's it's. I think it's important to support people that support us. And if you know, you're producing all this content, where can people watch it or find what you're working on? You know, we're doing a lot of stuff on, on YouTube right now. We're just kind of, we've got this massive outdoor library. So we're kind of building that out. So it's just Chris Dorsey's Outdoor World, and, and uh, there's, I don't know, a few hundred episodes of, of various shows on it. Um, we're on Instagram, Sporting Classics TV, mm-hmm. and uh, website is, is just DorseyPictures.com, which, uh, which has kind of all of our productions, including IMAX. Uh, you know, Wings Over Water has its own, its own website, uh, the IMAX film, uh, which is just WingsOverWaterTheFilm.com. Mm-hmm. And what else? I think that's that's most of it. We have Sporting Classics TV, a website as well, which has a lot of the Sporting Classics shows itself. But, yeah, we're kind of in a lot of different places. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to encourage all of you, you have a voice, use it. You have a platform, use it. Reach out and make an impact in your own communities, in your own homes. Be a good steward to hunting in the land and um, preach principles of how hunting is conservation so um i appreciate all of you for tuning into this episode from chris's uh pita what did you call it the pita house of horrors welcome and goodbye (laughs) welcome i'm for people eating uh tasty animals so this is my pita paradise so (laughs) we'll see you guys next time thank you for tuning in thank you for listening to the wild and uncut podcast If you would like to hear more, be sure to subscribe to my Pursue the Wild digital series on YouTube and follow me at Christy Titus on Facebook and Instagram.